Web Marketing Networks podcast, episode number 42, where we're having a debrief from the Pro Blogger Conference on the Gold Coast. Welcome to the Web Marketing Networks podcast. Come behind the scenes of real-life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. Hey, it's Adam Franklin from the Web Marketing That Works podcast and here again with my co-host, Toby Jenkins. Welcome back. How are you? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ads. No, really good. Really good. Um, in exciting news, yeah, we had a... Lucy and I had a little baby girl, so hence why I haven't been involved for a few episodes. Thank you very much, audience, but um, it's been really an exciting and busy time. Well, congratulations, um, and thanks for sharing that with us, and glad, glad to have you back. So this is the show for people who love marketing on the web. You'll be taking behind the scenes of real-life marketing experiments. We'll look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll confess what's failed and reveal the truth about what really works. And this show is brought to you, as always, by our book, Web Marketing That Works, and specifically the bonus templates that go with it. So there are 33 of those templates, and they're free, and you can download them from bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book. Cool. So the topic for today's show is a debrief of the Pro Blogger Conference that was just on at the Gold Coast. I went along, and what I'm hoping to do is just talk you through some of the, the key takeaway points that I got from it. Um, how's that sound? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, it sounded as though there was such a great lineup of speakers. Um, there must have been a whole bunch of ideas from the, from the weekend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was three international keynotes and they were Rand Fishkin who we've seen at Inbound 2012 yeah there's Pat Flynn from the famous Smart Passive Income podcast and Chris Ducker um, who's British but he lives in the Philippines and I'd actually just finished reading his book called Virtual Freedom so there's a whole bunch of international aspirational contacts that I was really keen to to watch and to meet as well as a whole host of Australian speakers that I hadn't met or um seen before, including Susie Daphnis from the Australian Business Women's Network and Donna Moritz um, from Socially Sorted, who we've interviewed on the show before, but I actually met for the first time at ProBlogger. And along with that, there was the regular speakers like Darren Rouse and Shane Tilley, both from ProBlogger. So the first keynote for the session, or for the whole conference actually, was, was Darren Rouse. And for those that don't know him, which I'm sure many listeners do, he's the He's the founder of of ProBlogger, and he's been a professional blogger for, I think, over a decade, or has certainly been blogging for over a decade and making a lot of money for the lion's share of that time. And he's really been a virtual mentor of ours for for many years. But it's always interesting to hear what he has to say. And the key take-homes, for me anyway, in his keynote were really he spoke about success being a matter of just doing ordinary things. Mm. And the accumulation of doing ordinary things on a regular basis over time leads to that success. And he said that all bloggers, well, not all bloggers, but most bloggers are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Um, And he actually outlined a series of six different um, things that we can be doing to achieve that that success that he's achieved. Right. It was really quite reassuring, actually, because he also said it's not about learning the secret things that you don't know about. It's just the stuff you know you should be doing. Just do it and just keep doing it. <laughs> hasn't do it hasn't over that been a theme that we've heard really, um, you know, that whole idea of, you know, you've got enough information and you actually don't need more information. You know, it's action time and putting it into practice. And um, I guess we, you know, fortunately, a lot of people are reinforcing, seem to be reinforcing that message for us at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's it's not more knowledge you need; it's more action that you need. Mm. And in fact, the first point Darren made was you just got to start. And interestingly, at the conference, I think ninety percent of people there had a blog, and ten percent were looking to start a blog. But he said, you know, it's just a matter of, of getting started. We all have fears; we all have things that we don't know. Get it going. And he just gave an example of when he started; he had no experience, no skills, no history of sticking to anything, no money. <laughs> No network, no time, no niche, not to mention fear and um, perfectionism being one of his traits as well. So 
just by rattling off that list of things that were going against him at 10 years ago, it just goes to show, you know, that getting started and learning as you go is what you need to be doing. Mm. He said, don't wait to define yourself. Be, you know, don't wait to define yourself to get started. By getting started, that will help you define yourself and your yeah. voice. I like that because that iteration of, I mean, I guess, you know, we've found that over business for sure in that, you know, starting off as a web design only and then progressing, you know, starting off building templates and then changing that in week three <laughs> to a whole new set of business, um, just like just like his example, I guess. Yeah, yeah. He's certainly pivoted. He's certainly learnt a lot along the way. But the thing he kept coming back to was putting your readers first. And if you can do that consistently, then everything else will fall into place. He said there's so many distractions like monetizing it like your ego, like your traffic stats and everything else. But really, you've got to keep coming back to servicing your readers and understanding who they are and what they need and really how they are going to change as a result of your blog and your information. Mm. So focusing on, which was a, which was a bit of a um, take-home message for me, you're thinking about what transformation do you want your readers to experience as a result of coming to your blog. That's and a great way of framing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, part of that transformation as well as the fact that he said usefulness is king and we've certainly tried to put that into practice with all the templates we've released over the years and we found the traction for those has just been so huge mainly because I think they're actually useful and people can implement them straight away which yeah. is really nice to have Darren reiterate that. The other things I guess that I learned from Darren was to find your rhythm and that's probably the hardest part certainly for me over the years has been, you know, if you're going to blog, sticking to one a week, which I haven't, but mm. probably the, the Blue Wine News has been my most consist, our most consistent thing, but doing one a week as a bare minimum. Yeah. Um, and I think getting into a more disciplined routine with the blog would be useful because like we go through fits and spurts. We'll do like five in a week and then might be a bit quiet for a few weeks. So I think just trying to... And with our podcast as well, as you know, yeah. as I said on a few... Guilty. Days. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> totally guilty. We'll get to that more in the, in the Pat Flynn and Chris Duck of podcast session. But we started with a flurry because of that new and noteworthy. But then we've had a bit of a, a bit of a lapse because life got in the way. You know, you mentioned mm. you've had a baby and I went over to um, to Bali and the Wi-Fi there wasn't quite as good as it needed to be to keep the podcast going going consistently. But anyway, we'll be, we'll be back on track again. But finding that rhythm is, is so important. And just an example... I mean, Darren's famous for being pro blogger and having that blog, but his most successful blog is the Digital Photography School. And he has been in a regular content production rhythm for that for many years. But he he himself posts twice twice a day on his blog and does a weekly newsletter and a bunch of other stuff. But he just showed the numbers of, you know, over one year, he'll push out 300, 730 blog posts at, you know, two a day. Um, or wow. 52 weekly newsletters. So he made us consider the cumulative effect of what we do. Mm. You know, a weekly blog post is 52 articles in a year. And just looking at our blog, I think we must be over five, well and truly over 500 articles that we've written on our blog over the years. Mm. And just that cumulative effect is really quite powerful because you kind of forget about it. And I, I think, you know, that without wanting to um, go back to our book necessarily and, and you know blow its trumpet but that is that's the one difference between online and offline is the cumulative effect is so the compounding effect is just huge online um you know and that every piece of content stays there forever yeah um i mean we've spoken about it at length i guess so it yeah, even just to see that as um his experience is really nice as well to have that reiterated mm. And as we talk through uh, the Rand Fishkin um, SEO presentation, he draws back on that idea too that every piece of content you put on there is just more and more ways that Google can find you. And over years, Darren and Rand and everybody sort of saying you've got that many more opportunities for people to find you, mm. for readers to find you, and for readers once they discover you to then go back and read more and more of your stuff as well. So just to finish up, I guess, the review of Darren's session, it was to create meaning for your readers in much the same line of thought as that transformation that you want them to take, if you can deliver meaning for them or provide meaning for them, then that's what's going to keep people coming back. 
as opposed to just having content online for the sake of it, mm. really trying to connect with the readers. And actually, there was a, a quote that Darren mentioned from Shane Tilly. I actually really liked it. The trend is to chase eyeballs. They can have the eyeballs. I care about the hearts and the minds of my readers. Oh, nice. And that was really cool, I thought, because, yes, there's people that publish content to get the eyeballs and the clicks or whatever, but really, if you're connecting with your readers and their minds and their hearts, then they're the people that are going to be loyal readers, loyal customers, and become raving fans, which is probably a good segue into the second keynote, which was Pat Flynn. Mm. So Pat Flynn is a successful podcaster who I've listened to quite a bit, um, and he's... He's, he's, he actually he does a weekly podcast. I think he's up to episode 130-odd. And he's interviewed lots of big names in, in, in the world of marketing and online. But he says the most successful podcasts that he has are actually the ones with everyday people and not the big high-profile names that he's had, but um, the less well-known people. Right. Yeah. And is that sort of the, like his customers that he talks to or something, like who are the less well-known people? Yeah, p- p- case studies from his community, people he, he stumbles across that are doing great things but don't have the huge profile of, the, say, the Tim Ferriss or the Gary Vees of the world gotcha. but that are also achieving great stuff. And he also thinks that it's partly because people might get a bit intimidated by trying to be the next Tim Ferriss or Gary Vee because they're just so phenomenally successful. Mm. But it is... I think those smaller name people go to show that we can all do it. Yeah. And in fact, that was one of the, the key takeaways from the event too, is that we're all going on this journey and we're all going on the right track. Some people are further along it than others. And, you know, some other people are just starting. Some people are like Pat Flynn and have, have a huge following, but we're all going in the right direction. And if we just keep persisting and, and doing the right thing, doing those ordinary things that Darren talks about, then we will, we'll all get there. Yeah, and it's a journey that's fun too, um, as well. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to forget about that in the process. Really, is enjoying what you're doing mm. during the day to day stuff. And I got that impression from Pat Flynn that he was just enjoying every moment of it. He gets to hang out with his 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 um, his wife and young kids. He gets to interview a whole bunch of interesting people. He gets to work from wherever he likes, as well as travel the world and speak to people. But he said it's a really good balance for him because he loves meeting readers and traveling and speaking, but also misses his kids and loves seeing them. So he's got the luxury of being able to do whichever of those things that he actually really chooses, that he really wants to. But Pat was, um, he was such a well-rehearsed, confident, funny speaker um, that I just wanted to kind of make a mention that they did, men- I think Chris Ducker mentioned that he'd rehearsed it a lot and he just wanted it to be really good and deliver value for everybody, which was one of the things too that I think conveyed the fact that he really does care Mm. about his audience and his topic was actually how to get raving fans and he took us through this journey of basically going from a casual audience of people who may have found you via a backlink or through search or through the iTunes search engine and then turning them into an active audience of people who actually interact with you and might tweet your stuff all the way through to being a connected community and then on the top of the, of the uh, pyramid that he, that he drew up on the screen was raving fans. And there's no doubt that Pat's got tons of raving fans. There were stories of his, uh, his fan mail. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, you know, going to the post office box and getting all these gifts and letters and, and everything else from, from fans all around the world. And I've noticed from interacting with Pat, you know, a few exchanges over Twitter, he, te- he seems to reply to everybody. He's got a very caring and very generous approach to his social media and his everything that he does online, that it's obvious that he cares. Um, but he actually spoke about a couple of things. I have blogged about this as well, and I've blogged about Darren's keynote as well, so I won't go into as much detail. But the major quote that resonated with everybody in Pat's keynote was, if you want to change somebody's life, start by changing their day first. That's a cracker. Yeah, it's good, hey? Yeah. He gave the example of Ramit Sethi's blog, which Pat started reading as a college um, student. And there was an article that Ramit had written that Pat read, and it was about how to save 30 bucks a month on a bill. And Ramit had given him a script to, to, to follow over the telephone, calling up, I forget what it was, maybe it was his phone bill, maybe it was something else, but the fact of the matter is that Ramit had actually changed 
Pat Flynn's day by enabling him to save 30 bucks a month. And then Pat was now a raving fan for life. Yeah. Interesting. So really useful thing to be keeping in mind when we do all this stuff. Gradually, Pat spoke about getting your active audience more, turning into a connected community by engaging them with more questions and surveys and kind of like a game show. He said, instead of asking for, instead of asking questions, ask for answers. And it's a slight distinction because he said on game shows, we don't, we watch them, we love them. We don't really care for the contestants at all. They're, they're kind of irrelevant. What we love is giving the answers. Mm. And so we, you know, he's, he, he told us example, he loves to play along at home and scream out the right answer. And he really feels a part of it. Like if the contestants weren't there, it wouldn't matter. So giving your audience the opportunity to tell you the answers as opposed to posing questions was an interesting way of mm. looking at it. Um, and look, finally, I guess the whole idea of having raving fans, he did mention that book, Thousand True Fans, and the fact that you don't need too many true fans to have a successful, profitable business. And it's only ever going to be a small percentage of your audience anyway that are the true fans and they're the ones that buy from you, that listen to you, that promote you. And if you've got, if you really look after those people and show them the love and treat them, give them some individual love, show them a lot of um, attention, then you will have a, a, a consistently profitable business. Pat did a, um, he did a nice touch. He, he picked, you know, one person in particular out of the audience and did a magic trick for them, which was really cool for that one person. But then he did a personal touch for everybody and he made us reach under our seats. And there was a, a, a thank you card from Pat, which I've got here. It says, you know, thank you for watching my presentation. I appreciate you. And it's got a playing card on the back and his email address as well. So it was this really nice touch that he did for everybody to make them feel special. And, you know, he, he replies to all the tweets. So I was, I was really impressed by Pat's work and thought it was a lot that he taught us that we can emulate. Yeah, great. Next uh, next keynote, or it wasn't a keynote, it was a session to be completely accurate, but it was Rand Fishkin, who's the SEO guru behind Moz. Mm. And SEO is often one of those things that scares some people because traditionally it's been made seem so confusing by SEO specialists. But Rand is one of those people that he's not only the best in the game at SEO, with his company, Moz, but he can explain everything so simply. And that's why I've always loved Rand's stuff and have gravitated to learning from him through particularly his Whiteboard Friday videos that he does. But he basically gave us a great analogy of SEO, and that is that it's like a big, heavy flywheel. And just like we speak about in the book, you know, if you publish content, you get hopefully people sharing it through social media and more people find it. And if it's great, people will link to it which means it gets pushed further up the search engines and therefore more people are finding it through search. And it is, as Rand was saying in this presentation, just like a giant flywheel. He said that you publish it, you get amplified through social, you earn backlinks and you grow your authority. And as you grow that authority, it means next time you publish something, you're going to rank higher, which earns you more search traffic, more shares and more links. And you keep turning that giant flywheel Back to that compound interest effect again, huh? Absolutely, that compound interest effect. And it can be really slow and uh, difficult at the start, but as you just do it, can, those little ordinary things over time, then you do get that, that compound interest and that flywheel moving. And then he, he talks about, you know, once you've got that authority, basically once you publish something, it's going to be showing up on the first page of Google for whatever you want to write about, within reason, of course. Mm. Um so it's definitely something that bloggers need to pay attention to because it just is such a powerful way to get essentially free qualified traffic and a very basic understanding of how it works is all you need. He basically urged us to take three minutes on each blog post to think about SEO. He said the first minute, spend figuring out what keywords to target and by doing that, what you really need to do is brainstorm what keywords you'd like to rank for and what keywords you think would bring you your ideal customers then research it or research those keywords using tools like the keyword Google Keyword Planner and this new one we've often talked about Uber Suggest, which is great. But it's got one of those annoying capture forms before you can get the data. Mm. There's a better tool. Well, it's probably the same information called keywordtool.io, 
which he said he calls keyword Tulio. <laughs> Uh, but also and also SEM Rush, which is a more advanced tool, but it's also a paid product um, as well. So Keyword Toolio or KeywordTool.io really just looks at all the different. If you if you're focusing on a keyword phrase, that's two words. It'll give you all the longer tail variations and suggestions based on that. Mm. And then basically, use once you've decided which keywords you're going to use and you've verified it that it's got some traffic using the Keyword Planner tool, simply just use those keywords in the title of your article and in the blog post itself. Hmm. So really, simple, simple stuff. stuff. Yeah, simple yeah. stuff. Again, if you're just getting in the habit of doing it on a regular basis, then it's going to happen. The, the, the quote for me from his session, he said, um, I hit publish for the very first time and everyone just showed up, said no blogger ever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, you know, like... No one on their first blog posts has thousands of readers or even hundreds of readers or probably even any readers. But over time, it builds up and, you know, like Darren said, like Rand said, stick at it, persist, do the simple, ordinary things, and it all builds up over time. So there are a couple more that you wanted to go through, ads? Yeah, Donna Moritz, who we've had on the show before, I interviewed her recently and she was actually mm. the winner of Australia's Best Business Blog. And she was great because she's a visual content specialist and she's taught us a lot about it but she gave a session on creating infographics and using tools like word swag where you can basically feel like a designer but you don't need the design skills you can take pictures that you've made and put text over the top of it and you'll notice in some of the blog posts that i've done i've done that and tried to create slides uh, images i should say with quotes from speakers and pictures of them and the good thing about creating your own images is they look cool but they're totally uh, free from any copyright issue, yeah. yeah, rights free. Because oh. you've made them, you, doesn't, you don't have to worry about. Such a common issue, isn't it? Totally common. Yeah, and and just so difficult too. So she said, don't fall, never fall into the trap of using Google image search when you're looking for stuff, because you, you're probably going to be breaking some sort of copyright issue. But if you can make your own, then um, then it's you're a great tip. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'll skip through this a bit quicker. Now, um, Shane Tilly gave an email marketing talk, and the key takeaway for me for that one was find all the emails that you don't see or you don't know about, and by that I, I, he meant, and I'm explaining, things like autoresponders that might go out when you submit a form or through an invoice or what happens when somebody, or what happens like when somebody signs up for something actually go and track down all those emails because chances are you haven't looked at them ever or for ages and you want to make sure that they're well written and um, it's a good opportunity to track them down and fine tune them because that's something that I know I haven't done for a little while. Like an email audit? An email audit, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because of course we see the regular Blue Wine news that we write each week. Mm. We read it, we proofread it and we send it off but it's those other emails that you don't often, you don't always revisit that often. So that's the action item from from uh, Shane Tilly. Chris Ducker and Pat Flynn gave a joint session on podcasting, and it was big, it was entry level stuff for people who were looking to build a podcast. But it was really cool because, as listeners of the show and as you know, Tobes, we followed Chris Ducker's format and also John Lee Dumas from the Entrepreneur on Fire podcast, they lay out this very very detailed plan of attack, not only how to technically set up your podcast, and Pat Flynn's training, free training tutorial videos are outstanding. We looked at them, plus the handful that John Lee Dumas includes as a bonus when you buy his $3 Kindle book, or 99-cent Kindle book, I think it is now. But that's for the technical side of things to, to get it started but then the launch process as well, which I'm so grateful that I discovered these handful of podcasters who've been so generous to share the information because we, we literally went through it step by step and did it ourselves and everything they say was true in that if you start with five podcasts when you launch, that's excellent because when people see it for the first time, they can listen to other shows and because once you get subscribed, the, the Google iTunes has that new and noteworthy. Ah, uh, Google iTunes. iTunes has its new and noteworthy section for podcasts. Mm. And if you've got 
it looks at things, it looks like downloads, subscribers, and reviews. So the more of all of those three things you can be doing, the more it's going to rank you on the new and noteworthy. And within 24 hours of us launching our podcast, we're on the top of new and noteworthy. We're in one of the top um, podcasts of all of iTunes, top for business in the new and noteworthy section. And we also started with a whole bunch of episodes up our sleeve so that we could be releasing one every couple of days so that we made the most of that eight-week new and noteworthy period. Yeah. And it was exactly what they taught in this session at ProBlogger. It was great because even though we heard it before, we'd actually implemented it and could go, yep, these guys are, you know, tick, tick, it, tick. it works, tick, 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 and wouldn't have changed anything about our launch. The only thing that I was guilty of, as we said earlier in this show, was that we started with a, with a flurry. We were on a new and noteworthy for actually, I think it was actually 11 weeks. So this eight-week period must sometimes extend or maybe it's because there's not as many new podcasts coming onto the Australian podcast on iTunes, but who knows, but we're on there for about 11 weeks. And then we made that transition to what's hot, although because we haven't actually been publishing as many episodes because you've had your baby, Mm. I went overseas for the best part of a month and we actually went a little bit quiet, which, you know, yes, consistency is great, but you don't want to burn yourself out and stress out too hard. You've got to live life and do other things and going on a trip overseas and having a baby is obviously very, very important, um, more important than a podcast. But that said, getting back into the rhythm is something that I really want to be doing and doing one or two episodes a week so we can keep that momentum. And not if it, for the regular listeners, have something for them every week to listen to and not feel like they've been abandoned by us. So mm. that was really the key takeaway from that podcasting session. All right, so three more points I want to make. The first is was Chris Ducker's session on the business of you. And I, we hadn't actually discovered Chris Ducker when we published our book, but he's really come on our radar in the last three or four months when he was massively building his personal profile and his podcast and his book. And I think his book has sold like 20,000 copies, uh, which not only is a book really valuable, and episode 41 uh, is where I give my book review of virtual freedom, so feel free to listen to that. But the major takeaway from him was that if you are yourself, then it's, your content's 100% original, it's 100% you. So if you be yourself, you've got no worries about you know, plagiarizing or copying other people. You're yourself, you're 100% original, and that's the best way to be. That's the best way to grow your profile because there's only one you and you can't, no, no one else can copy you if you're being yourself. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. And also, I guess that's, you know, that's, yeah, the sum of your experiences and all that kind of thing means that you have a slightly different opinion to other people or you've got your own take or, you, you know, your own set of references that you can compare um, and use as part of your advice as well. So, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, you've had your own experiences as seen through your lens as you as an individual running your business or marketing your stuff and that's, that's unique to you and therefore it makes an interesting story and you're speaking from the heart and it's lots more engaging it's lots more shareable uh, all of the good attributes that you want to be doing with your content so just be yourself (laughs) good takeaway message i think yeah thanks chris uh all right then so then we had susie daphnis from the then we had susie daphnis from the australian business women's network who i followed for many many years and had the privilege of meeting at the conference she gave a talk on the business of blogging and to be fair, I think most, I guess the breakdown of the audience, I think there was about 10 or 15% of people there were business bloggers, which I consider us in. We've got a business and we've got a blog to help market that business. Whereas a lot of people there were bloggers first and foremost who were then hoping to monetize it and turn it into a business. So mm-hmm. Susie really gave some great tips on all fronts there and she spoke about her personal journey of her Australian Business Women's Network business slash blog. But the thing I took away from it was the importance of having a team. And yes, we've got designers and developers and other type of roles too that Chris Ducker mentions in Virtual Freedom, but we don't have an editorial team. And Susie actually has, I think, 10 or 14 different writers for her blog. And we've got ourselves, and over the years, us, you know, the the Blue Wire team have contributed articles. but I really see an opportunity for us to grow the number of contributors we have for our blog. And I guess it's also a great time to introduce Will Blunt, who has 
already written three articles for our blog and he's come on as chief contributor writing a fortnightly post for us so to really not lighten the load on us it's really to give people an opportunity to blog on it and share their insights and thoughts but also free us up to achieve our goal for the quarter which is actually to be doing lots of guest blogging on other people's blogs Mm. Um, but if you can grow a team then you get other people's experiences other people's stories and other people's insights on your blog, which makes it more interesting. And as a business as well, it allows you to free up time to focus on other stuff, like monetizing or like doing consulting or speaking or the other things that you, that you also want to be doing. So your takeaway for that was, was, was to grow our editorial team and to really, I guess, appreciate and say thanks to, to Will for coming on board as, our, um, as a contributor. Yeah, I mean, he knocked knocked it out of the park with that uh, <laughs> that ultimate your ultimate blog checklist, right? Yeah, um, yeah, he absolutely brained it. So he earned his stripes, no doubt about that. He sure did. His very first blog post for us, first guest blog post, and it was our best performing blog post of all time. Yeah, and Tobes and I have been blogging since two thousand and eight. <laughs> Probably Quite humbling. Hundred, very humbling. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Written hundreds and hundreds of articles, and then Will comes along first go. He had it went viral. It had over, or for us anyway, you know, had uh, had 1,200 shares in three days, which was phenomenal. So he then wrote a follow up post explaining what he did that contributed to that success. So yeah, very very pleased and um, excited by having Will on the on the writing team. I reckon. All right, now for the final speaker that I want to talk about is Matthew Mikulowicz. I think I said that properly. It's a Polish name. He was the, he gave a really electric keynote on the start of the second day and not so much about blogging as such but more about goal setting and success and the psychology that contributes to that and then the audience who were bloggers can apply those techniques to their own blogging and to their own personal journey. Matthew was um, he's a Polish guy who's lived in America for a bit and now lives in South Australia uh, but he's He's the very first person that he looked up to as a, I guess, a role model and someone he aspired to be like and someone he learnt about success from was Arnold Schwarzenegger. So uh, in the early stages of the keynote, he, he got us all to think, he got us all to write down our biggest personal challenge at the moment, write it down on a piece of paper or on an iPad or computer. And he said, I want you to think, what would Arnie do? And so <laughs> it was really funny. He's got the... The fact he's got this Polish accent made some of the stuff he said absolutely hilarious. Um, but really, he's studied Arnie as a case study of someone who has been successful and has been able to pass on a lot of the lessons of success. And aside from working out two hours in the morning and working out two hours in the afternoon, Matthew was able to share with us the traits of people that are actually able to achieve their goals. And the first part of it really is to define success. And what does success mean for you? And I remember when we started our business tapes nearly a decade ago, it was along the lines of success being having the time and financial freedom to live the lifestyle we choose and do things with the people we love. And essentially about having options and being able to choose whether or not you, you, you did them. Mm. And I still feel that's true to this day. I mean, if we want to be doing stuff with family or doing stuff for charity or doing stuff for our <coughs> personal development or for fun, you know, that's still the goal of, of, of having a business that supports that type of lifestyle. Absolutely, yeah. And, I mean, to be honest, like in the last month, I've never been more grateful to be in charge of my own time than um, to be able to, you know, choose to spend the time with um, the little bub. And, uh, and you know, it's been quite demanding and I've been pretty grateful to know that I have the time in my day to do that. Um, it's been unreal. Mm. Matthew also spoke about, you know, how do you actually, what can, well, firstly, he said, once you've defined success, you've really just got to put the goals in place. And we've always been setting goals since even before, um, even before Blue Wire, obviously, you've always had like Mm -hmm. Olympic goals and broken that down in your professional and elite sporting career. But specifically with with Blue Wire, we've had goals from from day one. um, And every 90 days, we set our personal goals and the business goals and revisit them on a regular basis and assess how we've gone at the end of those 90 days. And it really has been phenomenal seeing what we might 
you know, visualise and actually print out on a piece of paper at the start of a year or at the start of a 90-day period. Like you typically we write the 90-day ones and we visualise the, the two-year the two year goals. But then at the end of that period, looking back and actually seeing, wow, these things have pretty much all come into reality. Happened or not, yeah. I mean, it's mm. been incredible. And they don't all happen, but no, a lot of them do. Yeah. And the fact that they're written down, it's I think that is a, a huge part of it. And that's certainly what Matthew's suggesting too, is that it's, and it's supported by 80 years of research, is that people with go- goals have an increased level of performance. Um, so the things to actually do to achieve your goals, he says, is comes down to really two things. One is focus and second is context. So focus, what do I really want to achieve? And part of that is that having them written down and documented. And then secondly, the context, what must I, what must I do or not do to make it happen? So it frames it as a question. The only question to ask, he says, is, will this opportunity help me achieve my goal? And it's as much saying no to things as it is saying yes to things mm. and keeping laser-like focus on what it is you want to achieve. He gave a pretty interesting... He told a few interesting stories about what stops most people as well from achieving their goals because you hear lots of things, especially New Year's, I want to be healthier, lose weight, stop smoking, all those usual things. But he said the reason people don't achieve those things necessarily is because they don't have enough desire. So they don't want it. Essentially, they don't want it badly enough. And it can become too hard. Uh, So people are saying it's too hard or I can't do this. It's typically because there's not enough desire. And he said the solution there is basically either to have a carrot or a stick. And he said there's always a way if there's enough desire or there's enough fear. (laughs) (laughs) The two-edged sword. Yeah, the two-edged sword. (laughs) And he gave this example of someone who was scared of heights and scared of spiders. He said, what would it take, what would I have to pay you to climb up to the tallest tower in um, in Dubai and parish, jump off that and pull, pull the cord on a parachute and float down into an empty swimming pool full of big hairy spiders? And he said, and he said, would he, would he do it for a hundred bucks? He said, nah. And he pushed the price up, you know, a hundred thousand bucks, nah. A million bucks, nah. And he's gone, oh, okay, so... Maybe you, maybe you won't. And she's going, yeah, I wouldn't do it. There's no way you get me to jump off. So just when this lady thought, yeah, there's no way you could ever get me to jump off. The world's tallest building, parachute into a swimming pool of hairy spiders. He said, what if I said every one of your family and friends and loved ones would all be killed if you didn't parachute off the building and land into the spiders? Would you do it then? And she said, yeah, I guess I would. Mm. And because in that situation... The desire of the money wasn't enough, but the fear of actually having loved ones, you know, it's a pretty extreme example. Yeah, yeah. But he said, yes, you would, because you want to keep those people in your life. Mm. And so when there's enough desire or enough fear, there's always a way. So if you want it badly enough, you can find a way, yep. was, is the long and the short of it. And he also said that fear is progress, because every time you go into the unknown, of course there's going to be fear, because it's, it's unknown. And every time he's done something that has scared him, whether the examples he gave was like starting his own business or speaking to a big audience or writing his book, he said there was always an element of fear because it's unknown and that's natural. But then as soon as you do it once, you know what that experience is like. And whether even if it doesn't go well, there's not that unknown and therefore the fear subsides and then you grow and then you can challenge yourself for the next goal, which is going to be scary because it's unknown. But at each and every time you do it, fear is a sign of progress because you're actually doing new things, learning from what's unknown and suddenly becomes known. Mm-hmm. And then finally he said, when you're down and out, just think, what would I need to do? <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> yep. And he gave us his book, actually. He gave everyone in the audience a copy of Life in Half a Second, which I haven't been able to put down. Really good read so far anyway, and I'll do a review of that book later on. So that's the uh, wrap-up of my take-home things, Topes, from the Pro Blogger event. Yeah, wow. That sounds like a great couple of days, Ads. Yeah, it was really good. And certainly um, the people there were fantastic. It was really good for networking and meeting people and 
sharing experiences because as we've noticed a lot of the time when you tell people that you blog or you tell people that you do web marketing a lot of people don't necessarily really understand what you're talking about <laughs> the most the vast majority the vast majority don't especially out of our friends too and to go to a conference where there's 500 over 500 people there that understand blogging and understand that you create content and they can, you can talk about seo and email marketing and open rates and a b testing you know, it's, it, it was a real sense of belonging there. Yeah. There's a lot of that stuff you and I talk about, mm. but for them, you know, it's not really it's not really common chat amongst um, our friends. No, well, I mean, it took until my mum was uh, helping with the editing and proofreading of our book for her to understand after nine years of business exactly what we did. <laughs> yeah. So, absolutely, that would have been quite refreshing. Yeah, nice to be around. Um, People, people that, 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 that knew the content chat anyway. Yeah, awesome. All right, so that wraps up our debrief of the ProBlogger event. The show, as always, is brought to you by a book called Web Marketing That Works. And as Tobe said at the start of the show, you can get your hands on the bonus 33 free templates at bluewiremedia.com.au slash book. And as always, we're trying to deliver actual advice, so hopefully you got something from the show. Um, the feedback and questions are always welcome. So please let us know via email or Twitter. My email address is toby.jenkins at bluewiremedia.com.au or at toby underscore Jenkins on Twitter. And I'm adam.franklin at bluewiremedia.com.au or franklin underscore adam on Twitter. If you enjoyed the show, we would really value an honest review on iTunes. It certainly Gives, helps give us visibility and helps give us feedback on how we can improve the show. So if you do have time, we'd love a five. Star, we'd love a review, and people that do leave us a five star review will give a shout out in the uh, in the show notes and on the show. And I also just want to say a big thank you to Joe Stokovic. I hope I've said that right. Who's reached out via Twitter to say that she listens to the show and has inspired her to. Um, get her marketing consulting uh, going. So thanks, Joe. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, Joe, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you next time.